Bine ați venit! Așa cum v-am obișnuit, sunt Diana Andone, directorul Centrului de Learning din Universitatea Politehnică din Timișoara. Astăzi avem un webinar ceva mai deosebit și mai interesant. Este un webinar construim împreună dedicat ideilor noi din universitățile europene și, bineînțeles, a microcredențialelor, noile tipuri de forme de educație și de validare de educație. Este un webinar care va fi biling, în curând voi face și introducerea în limba engleză. El va beneficia și de traducere simultană din engleză în română, fiindcă în mare parte vom vorbi doar în engleză. Pentru aceasta puteți să mergeți și să selectați, dacă sunteți în Zoom, pe interpretare și să selectați la interpretare română și să închideți, să faceți mute off, să închideți... Uh, sunetul original, care este, bineînțeles, în engleză. Deci aceasta este rugămintea cea mai mare pentru cei care ne urmăresc în Zoom. Cei care ne urmăresc pe Facebook și pe YouTube, întregul webinar va fi în limba originală, fie că este în engleză, fie că este în română. Ne cerem scuze, nu avem cum să facem traducere simultană acolo. Asta este prima observație. La fel, puteți să puneți să ne adresați întrebări în Q&A, în Zoom și în chat să vă prezentați, iar cei care ne urmăresc pe Facebook și pe YouTube sunt colegii noștri acolo, puteți să adresați întrebări, ele ne vor fi nouă uh, transferate. Um, am să prezint acum în limba engleză. So, hello everybody, I'm Diana Andona, I'm the director of the Elon Center in the Polytechnica University of Timișoara and we are now at the sixth edition of the Shaping Together a webinar. This is a special edition dedicated to European universities project and alliances, and we are going to speak mainly about the UDRES project and the ICE project, which is a new project funded by the AIT, the European Institute for Technology, through the Higher Education Innovation Project uh, program, and uh, we are having special guests. This is going to be a webinar which is going to be mainly in English, Those which want to listen in English, you stay in the original audio if you are in Zoom. Those who want to listen the Romanian translation, you need to move to the Romanian interpretation in Zoom. On Facebook and on YouTube, it's going to be in the original language as uh, I'm, I'm speaking it now. <laughs> Uh, I will st this topic today is about micro-credentials, and I will go directly to present about uh, and discuss about micro-credentials, because that will be probably the most interesting bit uh, today to find out what it is uh, micro-credentials. As you know, as you are all aware, you need and you can ask questions in the Q&A if you are in Zoom. Please use the chat for presenting and introducing yourself. If you are on Facebook and on YouTube, please ask questions in the comments and our colleagues are going to uh, bring uh, the questions to us in Zoom. As a standard uh, Shaping Together webinar, this is going to be with open digital badges as validation, which is one of the reasons why we are also discussing about micro-credentials uh, today. So um, I will start uh, the first presentation, which is going to be I will just go very quickly over several things uh, as I have a lot of slides here, but I will try to present it only very, very briefly. Um, some ideas about why micro-credentials and then I will introduce also in the same time my, my colleagues and, um, and everybody else. So we are able to see and to speak about uh, that. So let me just uh, go to the write PowerPoint presentation and say okay so we are good now and we are going to uh, to speak I'm going to present about uh, micro credentials uh, just one tiny second as I want to be able to have first the title about the micro-credentials. We are having uh, this presentation together with uh, 
Dr. Don Alcott with Michael Karpyshek and Katalin Sondian. I'll present and say something about them just before they are going to go with their presentation. And this webinar is part of the UDRES project and EINS Open Lecture Series and is supported by IEEE Romania and EDA. First of all, why micro-credentials? I already done part of this presentation before during the Open Education Week, so I will go quite fast over the first bit. Why? It's a huge market. Uh, beside of the higher education, beside everything what's happening in education worldwide, and especially in the education with a digital twist, which is looking at the, the shorter periods of time, how we can do it online and how we can do it with digital tools or digitally enhanced learning, it's a big market. So that's one of the reasons why micro-credentials have become very important nowadays in the education sector. Holonic has done a, a present uh, to say a structure, especially from the perspective of the employees, because one of the most important bit for the push towards micro-credentials is the um, industry, is the community, is the market, because the market is demanding shorter period of training with more dedicated structures and with uh, some access worldwide because now you can work remotely and you can work anywhere so they might want to hire somebody from another part of the world but to have the same credentials and the same knowledge as those which they are hiring locally or regionally so there are several reasons why this is so important for the industry and for the market and holonic has split this in the micro markets into, into micro credentials and uh, going up to the degree and accredited programs I presented this, I will not go over this. I just want to say that their split is based on hours and on types of accreditation and validation. So they are usually, these are the two most common uh, categories when we are discussing about micro-credentials. How many hours, so automatically how many credits, how, how important it is, what you are doing, what is the competencies, what you are learning there, and also if it is validated, accredited by international associations by uh, quality assurance things. And this is what we are also going to discuss today. Micro-credentials are uh, very important in the digital education action plan, which was launched exactly one year ago. And uh, they are defined there as a proof of the learning outcomes that a learner has acquired following the short, transparently assessed learning experience. And they're usually short standalone courses done on site or on learning or in a blended format so that's the standard definition which is established in europe we are looking very much forward hopefully in a year to the launch of the european digital credentials which is going to certify in sort of portfolio e-portfolio and part of the european curriculum vitae uh, the formal and the non-formal education and you have a lot of information on those links which i put here obviously these credentials are based on interoperability because it's also a technical bit on the credentials not only the quality assurance or the formal or the vision and that's basically at this moment based on the World Wide Web uh, Institute uh, Consortium, sorry, a verifiable credentials data model, which is very famous and it's used uh, at this moment as the standard. Um, short courses are validated usually through massive open online courses. This is how they started. Micro masters and micro specialization are very, very famous nowadays in MOOCs. This is a screen capture for future learn where you have a lot of short courses, which uh, if you follow several of them, it will even validate as a training program. Informal micro-credentials are like this one. There can be workshops, they can be webinars, they can be different other, uh, how to say, courses, small courses which you are doing, where you will get an open badge or an open certificate, which is validated digitally, and you can carry on in a uh, electronic wallet with you everywhere. And these are, for example, other uh, different, um, uh, how to say, micro certificates, which are valid for informal learning. Then informal learning, you will have several short courses. I have it here listed some of the short courses which we built at different levels for open virtual mobility, for the digital culture, and then you get to this. How you do this technically, you validate it using three issues. One is the author, authoring organization industry. 
then it's the course, then it's the training level, and all of that you do is through an automatic trigger and to a validation of an independent, um, how to say, issuer or independent uh, badge, o- badge owner or badge wallet. In our case, this is happening through a Moodle-based platform, and we are using Moodle and Badger to integrate that in all of the uh, instances, as you probably have been able to see in uh, what our university is doing in terms of validating um, open uh, certificates and open badges, which are the validation and the public display of a micro certificate uh, program. And this is, for example, how they look and how you can share them on social media and how at the end uh, you will be able to validate and have them in different in different formats and how they are validating and they get all the information, what sort of activities that certificate has done and uh, at what level and so on, and how you also move it to everywhere else. And this is, for example, a wallet of different Badger integration. Uh, in terms of diploma and the formal diploma, one of the most common nowadays is through EPSI, which is the, um, the European blockchain system. And our university is part of the network of almost uh, 20, I mean, I think there are 40 uh, universities at this moment, which are the early adopters of the blockchain diplomas, and we are issuing diplomas uh, in blockchain. So what we are going to discuss today is basically vision from the institutional point of view, and the, also especially focusing on higher education, but also on, on continuous education and continuous development, how you built up the policies and the structure, how you built up the quality and what are the evidence effects of the micro certificates. All of this is part, as I said, of UDRES uh, uh, alliances, where we are looking now how we can deliver in a European university uh, campus, multi-campus in fact, with uh, seven different institutes in, in different countries, a common degree or a common certificate basically using short training programs. And this is, uh, these are again the speakers today. And I'm going to introduce first uh, Dr. Don Alcott, and uh, I will just uh, stop and I will, uh, at this moment, I will not take questions if that's possible. Uh, Don, uh, I will kindly ask you to start your video. Um, so I can ask you to join me. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> so um, I'm very happy to welcome uh, Dr. Don Alcott Jr., who is, uh, I can say, a friend of mine for a very, very long time. He's a, a senior fellow of Eden of the European Digital E-Learning uh, Network. Uh, he's a very, very, uh, how to say, famous, I can say, uh, online and e-learning uh, expert. I can say something. He lives now in Romania. He's an American citizen, but he lives in Romania. So uh, I, I, I will chase him sometimes to try to say something in Romanian language. He's the Eden Council uh, Fellows Chair and he's honorary professor of the University of South Africa and is, uh, as I said, uh, former president of USDA and so on. So Don, you are going to speak about the institutional impact and uh, some ideas about the micro certificate. Thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction, Diana. Um, I'm not sure famous is the, is the right word, but nonetheless, thank you for that kind introduction. Okay, first things first, micro credentials are not new. I was creating short programs 35 years ago. Uh, for some of you who are involved in continuing education and outreach, uh, you've probably been creating uh, short non-credit kinds of programs for a long time. So they're not really new in the sense um, that we haven't offered them, we certainly have. What is different about the current phase of micro-credentials is the quality standards that we are choosing to put on these today, which is a very positive thing, which I think my colleagues will address uh, a little bit later. Let me also add that one of the most invaluable resources we have for micro-credentials today is the work that vocational and technical education has done over the last five or six decades. They have experience with doing competency-based standards setting performance-based standards, uh, particularly in the vocational and technical disciplines and skill domains. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, 
okay, you all know you have partners. From an institution, as you get ready to move into this arena, or if you choose to move into this arena, you've got multiple parker, partners that you can choose to engage with. Obviously, employers are going to be a major one. They are the ones who are looking for better skilled employees. And um, our role as providers is to see if we can help meet those needs. Okay. What I want to say about partnerships is why partner? You partner because you can share resources. You can share talent, you can share programs, you can share content, and you can share lessons learned. And in general, it's a way that your institution can take less risk as you sort of get into this and see if it's where you want to go. Next slide, please. Now, in higher education universities, I know you're going to find this hard to believe, but boy, do we like to compartmentalize things. And because of that, oftentimes we think of things as either or or separate from each other. What we know about micro-credentials today is they're going to be digital, at least partially. And so I always suggest that one way to think about micro-credentials is to think about in the broader contents, meaning, what are you doing in your digital space at your university? What are you doing with open content? And how can advanced digital credentials, micro-credentials, fit in to that broader mission of your university? Okay, so I'm, I want to encourage you to think in a more integrated way in terms of what things seem to fit. Again, this can be a better use of resources. And I might, might also add right up front, uh, Diana shared what a big market micro-credentials is, but being a big market and being able to create revenue uh, at your university are not the same questions. So there are financial issues that are gonna have to be addressed as we go forward. Next slide, please. Diana sort of talked about this earlier. I'm not gonna repeat it. Um, it really is, you know, micro-credentials are shorter based uh, credentials. The idea that they're stackable or combinable is an interesting phenomenon of combining both credit and non-credit credentials um, together. Um, and of course, um, the problem and the challenges that we're gonna face doing that is we have to build consensus on what constitutes specific competencies and particular skill levels. Next slide, please. Here's the questions you need to be asking uh, at the leadership level within your university. Are micro-credentials part of your institutional strategy? What are the goals of micro-credentials for your university? Is it to enhance uh, employer competitiveness in your region? Is it to generate additional revenue for the university? Uh, it could be both of those things. What skill-based programs showcase your institutional strengths and allow you to compete in this emerging market? I learned a long time ago in the continuing education and outreach uh, arena for universities is oftentimes we try to be all things to all people rather than targeting and focusing on our strengths at the institutional level. I think this is also going to be very important uh, in the micro-credentials market. And finally, you know, who pays? Institution, the government, students, public, employers, all of these, you know. Uh, we've been for years talking about um, open content and open educational resources being free, but they're not free. Free is relative. If you have open content at your university, that content has to be stored. It has to be distributed. You need people to do that. Sooner or later, somebody pays. So these things do cost money. So resources is going to be a continuing issue for us. Um, next slide, please. Lastly, and I need to speak to this because it's usually the one thing we don't want to talk about. But let me say it as clear as I can say it. 
the 21st century competitive advantage isn't going to be technology. It's not going to be micro credentials. It's going to be the leadership that is driving your universe. It is imperative. It is critical. Great leaders are front and center. I don't know if you see all these sound bites that come across LinkedIn and come across Facebook about leaders lead from the back and leaders lead from the side and everything else. Very simplistic approaches to leadership. If you've been watching what has been going on in the Ukraine, I can assure you where Mr. Zelensky is, is right at the front. Is your senior leadership at your institution out front? Leading by example always on the field. Is your senior leadership at your university, whether they're promoting micro-credentials or anything else for that matter, are they out there visiting with faculty all the time, visiting with partners? Empathy and compassion balance with conviction and resilience. You know, one of the things we've learned um, during COVID-19 and the global health crisis is empathy and compassion are an essential part of leadership as much as conviction and making decisions and other things we typically associate with leadership. Power is the reciprocal of empowerment, not its opposite. When you give power away, you get it back to you. Other people share it with you just as you share it with them. The planning imperative. We're talking about micro-credentials today, but, but planning is ongoing. And it's not just for bad times. Great leaders will tell you the best time to plan is when things are going really, really well. Now that seems almost paradoxical, doesn't it? But the truth is planning for what's next should be on your radar screen. And so I encourage you to give that serious thought. Plan for the future, particularly when times are good. And if you were to ask me what I think is the most critical leadership skill for the 21st century, whether it's micro-credentials, digital content, open educational resource, it's the capacity to lead change. Not to talk about it, not to, buy, not to write out a 30-page plan for change, but to actually be able to lead. Eight out of 10 leaders fail in leading change during implementation, when they try to do it, okay? And organizations have incredible talent, and yet incredible organizations fail every day. Why do they fail? They fail because they've got great talent, but they got people in the wrong jobs. More often than not, it isn't a question of talent in our organizations. It's about making sure that the people are in the right place to empower the programs and the systems we're trying to do, okay? All of these factors together collectively are gonna be questions that will need to be answered by your senior leadership team for micro-credentials, for open educational resources, for any major programs going, for, going forward. Uh, next slide, please. I'm gonna stop there. Multimesk, what the mult, numaibina. And in the spirit of Diana teaching me uh, my Romanian even better, thank you uh, very much. Thank you very much, Don. Mulțumesc mult de tot, Don. Mulțumesc, știi, să spui fără probleme, așa că pot să spui în românește. Mulțumesc. Cu mult drag, Don. So, Don, uh, I have, uh, before moving uh, to, to Michal and to discuss uh, what is the EU perspective, you pointed up something which I quite uh, somehow agree. I, I agree with a lot of things which you said, but something really stick to me is the leadership and the change. How important is leadership for the change? Uh, you know, change is never linear. Change is always uh, happening in, in bigger increments, in smaller increments. Sometimes you go round, round in circles and so on. If you want, because you also know the Romanian market and more than a half of yeah. our um, listeners are from Romania. So if you will want uh, to implement micro certificates in Romania as a leader, what will be the first thing which you will do? Not an easy question, I know. 
Well, actually, actually, to me, it is an easy question. It, it is who is most important in this formula? And in my view, it's going to be the people that are designing the micro credentials in the trenches. And that's going to be faculty, certainly. It's going to be teachers in, uh, in high schools if we engage the K-12 community. And it's going to be employers. Um, we have a um, we have a mixed history in higher education, and I think I can say that globally of of thinking we know what business needs. We we must be smart enough to decide what industry needs, and then when we go out there, we find out, wow, we don't know for sure what they need. And here's the here's the corollary: business leaders often don't know what they need. Okay. So, you know, you've almost, in some instances, not all, you've got the blind leading the blind. And I think the way you address that is you get everybody into the same room. So the answer to your question, at least initially to me, it's not about the money. It's not about whether micro-credentials is the mess, next best thing since, you know, chocolate milkshakes. It's about getting your local employers, some of your key faculty, um, much that we've learned about change and adoption in higher education, meaning early adopters, people who may be tuned in to digital online and open content, and um, maybe how micro-credentials is going to evolve. Get that dialogue going at, your, going at your institution. Because one of the reasons change fails, I think, is leaders don't stay with the process. And what happens, particularly in universities, that are very compartmentalized, who are very resistant to change in general, we never embed those changes into the culture of the organization. And the modern academy, even in 2022, has some very strong uh, traditions and values that are not gonna go away easy. And, uh, and I think that's why it is critical um, if we try to do this without engaging the people who are most involved, we're going to fail. So I think it's really critical to bring them together. Of course, you're going to need other partners, but those are the two, at least in my mind, that you have to have at the table. The employers who need the training and the people that are, have skills and the people who are designing the competencies and the assessments and talking and agreeing because the real issue is consensus. We all agree that's what constitutes that skill domain. You know, that's like... Uh, what we usually years. say, what it makes an engineer. Well, a few years ago, I had eight business deans in the same room asking if they wanted to be part of a joint degree program. And each university would contribute two MBA courses. They all agreed, they loved the idea. And then when they disbanded and I talked to them individually and I asked them which program was the best, every one of them said, well, ours. <laughs> that's, now that's a Dean, right? Our program is the best, of course. So again, uh, you know, I don't wanna belabor this because our colleagues are waiting, but I really think that uh, um, oftentimes the goals we wanna achieve we create obstacles ourselves because we don't engage the people that need to essentially be there at the table right from the beginning. So I'll leave it there. And by the way, uh, yes. I'm, I'm actually Canadian as well. I have dual citizenship. Oh, apologies for making no, no problem. Problem. <laughs> it, it It came in very handy when Donald Trump was president. I could say I was, I could say I was Canadian. <laughs> yes, and you are very international, if I can say that, because you uh, lived in different countries all the time. Thank you very much. So, my pleasure, Don, and uh, we will have a, a more uh, intimate discussion quite soon. But let's uh, first move exactly to this business science. So I'm very pleased that Don has raised the bar to the discussion of the business and international business and international and European perspective. And for that, I'm happy to have Michal Karpyshek 
uh, with us, who is the senior policy expert in UDRES European University Alliance, where uh, Sam Polten uh, Fachhochschule is the leader and our university, Politecnica University of Timisoara, is a partner. And he was uh, for five years the Secretary General of Eurasia, who is a political representation of higher vocational education in Europe. And he'd been also previously work as advisor for the Czech Minister of Education as the leader of uh, higher education in Czech Republic. So Michal, please tell us what's the perspective at European level and also from the business uh, one. Thank you, Diana. Uh, I learned something in the chat, uh, Buna Seara, uh, because uh, that was probably the most uh, used uh, contribution in the chat so far. So I guess it is a uh, good evening. Uh, I will try to share my screen uh, and hope it will work. Yeah, well, to contribute to the confusion, uh, I'm actually engaged in uh, San Polten, but I'm sitting in Prague. Uh, so I'm a Czech citizen and uh, I work for this uh, fantastic uh, European structure, which brings together partners from six countries. So it's a very international environment. And thank you for, for the introduction. Um, Diana, it sounds uh, better than the reality is. Uh, I got to this uh, debate more like uh, the one who was curious about what is going on because uh, if you look today in any higher education discussion uh, micro credentials pop out from every corner and uh, I, i've been part of the policy discussion at the european level trying to understand what is the potential and uh, what are the further directions and from that i would not say that uh, I know the answers. Uh, I knew some of the questions and uh, I will try to share with you and uh, the participants the, the concerns which uh, we were discussing uh, with the commission, uh, with a group of stakeholders. And indeed we were, uh, as I was, uh, as you said, uh, I was uh, secretary general of the uh, association uh, bringing together the professional higher education. We have uh, close links with the businesses. So we also wanted to to listen to the businesses and what do they see in the in this development and i think it's a amazing uh, momentum for sort of thinking of a new patterns uh, of opening up uh, higher education of uh, making higher education more flexibly yet and i will start with the first experience uh, i heard as well from uh, one of the that time high official from uh, the oecd saying well you as a higher education institutions, as universities, are left with the only thing which you have now, uh, and it's the qualifications. You lost the monopoly on uh, knowledge development. You lost the monopoly on uh, knowledge transfer. You lost the monopoly in uh, preserving the, the human knowledge. So the qualifications are now the only ones. And try to make yourself uh, relevant, otherwise this uh, will be taken from you as well by the others. And we have been discussing in higher education how to approach the micro-credentials that's uh, now for about two years. But you showed how dynamic the space of uh, private uh, initiatives uh, is in, in uh, learning and teaching. And I think this is something what we will have to try to find out how to live with that, because it brings new patterns into education which we have probably not used uh, that much uh, from the past. I'll say just a few words about the uh, UDRES just to uh, present what's the background because that it may probably explain some of the, the views and we'll go then through what I have seen uh, in the European discussion, what were the discussion with the colleagues and what we can probably try to think of for the future. Well, UDRES, a very complicated name and I'm still learning how to pronounce that. Uh, but it basically means engaged entrepreneurial European university with a focus on European smart and sustainable regions. And I think that uh, determines the, the network. Focus on regions, focus on skills, focus on innovation together with the partners from the businesses. You can see, uh, like uh, Don, I will not read uh, things which are in the presentation uh, to, to every detail. So you see the composition of the countries, 
and I have to say that I'm happy to say that uh, we just uh, found uh, about uh, new partners who will join us uh, in the next stages from from Germany and Netherlands who would strengthen the, the consortium even uh, more. The focus is uh, really on non-metropolitan regions, on the ecosystems which need to bring all the partners together to address the skills and the innovation which are important for making life in these uh, regions uh, better, bring the quality. We are focusing on the circular economy, sustainability, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, healthy aging, and uh, basically the quality of life in the, in the, in the regions. Uh, here are some of the values, and why I put it there is because there are a few which are really important for the micro-credentials from my perspective. It's the practice-based focus, it's the experimental mindset, it's the human-centered approach and inclusive. All the others are important as well and would be reflected, but I would still understand that the micro-credentials don't necessarily have to be digital in delivery. Uh, I appreciate the digital tools for keeping the credentials, for stacking the credentials and uh, putting them together. But in our case, I would still see a great uh, potential for short learning experience done even in the companies, in the practical field and learning from that. Well, there was a council recommendation uh, or the proposed uh, council recommendation which comes with the, this uh, definition. And again, I would not read it. It was interesting to see the development because uh, there are minor changes from the formal proposal, but they respect, uh, they show how much the stakeholder consultation was taken into account. So the major change is that the final decision, definition keeps the term small volume of learning because the formal uh, definition Propose the small short time of a learning. So it basically set up the micro credential time bound, whereas this gives much more freedom to any arrangements and proposes, well, let's agree what would be a small volume of, a, of learning. Uh, and I will get to that uh, later on. And then it specifies what might be the purpose of, uh, of uh, addressing the knowledge, skills, and competences. Uh, how they can be put together. And uh, if you look on the right side of the slide, there are the elements which are proposed by the commission to be the key standards defining the, the micro-credential, obviously the personal identification, but the content uh, and uh, sort of the demand level uh, identification, the way how the learning outcomes are defined and the way how the learning outcomes are assessed and uh, what would be the quality assurance. And I think this is one of the issues where we are still not very clear how to pro proceed uh, at the European level. This is the result of the lengthy discussion at the European level, well, lengthy. I, I would still say it was quite in a hurry, well, coming to the conclusion within one and a half year, but uh, there were various uh, series of, uh, of uh, discussion. And I wanted to point out that there are different views. For example, we found that in, a, I think there's only one country in uh, the world, New Zealand, which defines the, what's the short learning volume defines by the number of credits. I think uh, that's uh, something from 10 till uh, 40 in the New Zealand uh, qualification or the credit system. There was a discussion that in Europe, in order to make the micro-credentials relevant, but also manageable, the discussion would be somewhere between, let's say five and 10 ECTS, but even this hasn't been fixed yet, but that would be probably the scope of a, of a learning which we have in mind. There are different views and different demands by different uh, organizations. So that was interesting to see that some of them basically don't require that much focus on quality assurance, which is very much the case in uh, European higher education. There was a, there were some which didn't pay that much attention to, let's say, the, the assessment and approach of verifying the, the learning uh, uh, outcomes. Uh, but we have some European proposal on the table, and I think that will be the direction in which we will be moving further. 
when working in Russia, we still we ran the survey among uh, well, we got uh, 190 responses, which is uh, relatively high uh, based uh, compared to other surveys, and it shows the urgency of uh, of the issue. And we were asking what would be the purpose uh, from what the universities of applied sciences would see as the most uh, relevant uh, objective of micro credentials. And you can see that that's the upskilling and reskilling in professional qualifications. Whatever we say that it may serve the academic purposes, bridging uh, elements to further learning, the, the main focus as is seen, at least within the sector of professional higher education, is uh, bringing new skills, updating the skills, changing the skills, addressing the, the skills agenda. Skills in the wider concept of not only the, the technicalities, but uh, sort of supporting the flexibility and uh, future-oriented skills. But there are also obviously some other legitimate uh, issues like uh, the transfer from vocational education to higher education, uh, updating the alumni qualification. And I think that offers a wide uh, range of opportunities for higher education institutions. The second question would be, who are the main uh, target groups for the micro-credentials? And again, the main focus is on uh, employees from uh, collaborating companies, uh, upskilling, reskilling, and that makes a strong bond with the world of work, which may be used then for, so for quality assurance or quality enhancement of the other existing services uh, provided by universities. And new learners, number of us would have seen micro credentials as the possibility to reach to new target groups, whether it's the young uh, people who would not probably think of going to higher education or adult learners who would need to change their qualification, their knowledge and skills. I try to put that all in uh, some sort of package. And uh, once you ask, uh, indeed, it was interesting to see the reaction from the businesses at the European level, because usually they didn't comment on uh, higher education issues that eagerly. Uh, but here we got the statement from all the different possible business representations in Europe. I have to say that their focus was quite often more targeted towards vocational education and training and uh, upskilling people at uh, the relevant uh, qualifications, but also the concerns about what impact the micro-credentials may have on vocational education and training. But there was also very strong call for engagement of world of work into all quality procedures and all the conceptual uh, developments and bringing them as the partner. Again, we know that there are good discussions with the colleagues from the business on the curricula, on the institutional strategies, but this was a unusually strong uh, attention coming uh, from the businesses. So we see that there is something going on. The other thing is uh, what we were looking at uh, or what was the discussion is fine. What we are trying to set up is the framework for higher education, which may be formalized, which may have some regulations, but how do we deal with the private providers? And it's not those only those which you shown on uh, your fantastic overview, like uh, Coursera, Google, etc. But there's also a number of uh, individual companies which provide their own in-service training, and we need to find a way how to recognize that. And that uh, strengthens, in my view, the attention needed to recognition of prior learning, which is a very problematic issue in a number of countries and brings really a need of uh, reaching some mutual trust between the institutions, between the stakeholders, between the government agencies. I will try to speed it up. There was a discussion how to put the micro-credentials into the framework, and there's clear agreement that there should be some link to the qualification frameworks. We still don't know fully how. Quality assurance, and I think Cathy will speak about quality assurance in more detail, so I will uh, skip that part mostly. How do we do with the recognition of the micro credentials and their integration in uh, bigger qualifications? And uh, how do we look at the recognition of prior learning, which should be the tool to allow more uh, stackability for the, let's say, not full degree, but uh, for big part of uh, the qualification. And then there would be obviously the, the digital 
uh, tools and digital aspects. And I think you are far the, the better qualified, Diana, than me to speak about these uh, issues. I will skip most of that uh, still. There was, and again, this is the business perspective. They asked, we appreciate the micro credentials, but please don't make the system too heavy. Don't uh, make the restrictions too demanding. Uh, make it uh, more as the optional. So those who would provide some training, learning experience, don't necessarily have to register into some structure and framework. And on the other hand, the higher education institutions call, well, let's keep the trust which we have uh, reached in uh, higher education. We have this uh, wonderful European standards and uh, guidelines. Let's see how we can use them for making sure that we trust what is offered as part of the qualification and what can build basically the, the stones for the full qualification. Uh, well, I will leave uh, the quality assurance to, to uh, Cathy, as I said. Well, what we see is that really the great potential for changing the higher education landscape, but we have to be careful as well how far uh, we go. Uh, there is the great uh, possibility to bridge the missing links between higher education and vocational education and training, uh, especially bringing the new target groups or recognizing the, uh, the skills uh, and uh, competences achieved in other sectors of uh, education. I think this is uh, seen as uh, amazing opportunities to strengthen the links between higher education and the world of work and having the joint discussion as Don has mentioned, uh, we need to sit together uh, and uh, try to find out what would be the most uh, suitable arrangement. What are the challenges is uh, still the issue how far we go in sort of stacking the micro credentials up to the degree. Do we want to go to the doctor who would basically build his qualification from the different uh, micro credentials? Uh, and there are various critical voices, but there are also very optimistic voices. Uh, should we approach the micro credentials as the bigger package of other learning, flexible learning provisions? In a number of countries, there's the short cycle uh, qualification, like two year uh, degree. Should we? use the similar principles and uh, for that and for the micro credentials. Uh, how far we go in uh, regulation and uh, using the transparency to trust, there is the discussion about the list of uh, recognized providers who would take care of that, especially looking that it brings uh, lifelong learning, higher education, vocational education and training together. It's a uh, it's enormous agenda. And uh, there was clear call, especially from uh, the stakeholders in higher education, please build that on existing tools in the Bologna space. We are quite happy with the quality assurance. We are quite happy with the recognition procedures. They are not necessarily always implemented, but let's not invent some other tools which would make it even more difficult. And what may be the youth dress response, I think, uh, just briefly, we see the opportunity, and as I said, uh, the focus is on skills and the links to the, the regional uh, employers and uh, regional ecosystems. So this is one of the emerging opportunities. So we agreed that we will set up the task force on micro-credentials, so it's nothing uh, extremely action-driven, but uh, we need to learn what is the what are the practices in all six, eight uh, institutions what we can learn from each other, what may be the approach, but there's a great potential, which I see that uh, that would even enhance the sharing of learning units. And we can probably build the different learning blocks in different partner institutions and share them and put the different study programs together based on these building blocks. But this will take some time. So we need to find something which will show the capacity and persuade all the colleagues uh, on this way. Sorry if it took a little bit longer. Uh, I hope that uh, I could have at least shown some picture of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this, uh, Michal. It's uh, very interesting. And if I can uh, I ask you. I can't uh, hear you. Can't you hear me now? Let's see. Uh, because I switch. Let me Sorry, change. Diana, the... I don't hear you. Okay. Do you hear me now? 
everybody? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Because I was switching into the interpretation mode. Apologies for that. Uh, just trying to check everything, you know, control freak me. Uh, so uh, <laughs> uh, just to um, discuss something, uh, and I will pick up from where you mentioned the importance of the European University Alliances, and the importance of validation, in fact, at the higher education level, and also from this business perspective and the survey. What do you think that, um, are you, from the point of UDRES, for example, or any European University Alliance, will be the best way forward or the immediate way forward to be able to really deliver jointly maybe micro credential programs well, and we have a remark to speak a bit low a bit a little bit uh, slower sorry. we are hurrying up in english and uh, our colleague vlad is really trying to catch up with the translation and also the romanians who understand english are saying we go way too fast so um, let's slow down a bit I'm sorry, I was just aware of 10 minutes uh, which were assigned. Uh, uh, me too, me too, don't worry. <laughs> uh, from a European university perspective, uh, I think the micro-credentials uh, offer a much more flexible solution to developing the joint trust and uh, build the common products. I think uh, Looking at the national regulation on accreditation, on uh, funding, on uh, the, the requirements to the staff, developing the joint degree among four, five, six uh, institutions, I think it's a nightmare these days. Uh, whereas, whereas if we define what might be some sort of common building block, which might be integrated into the different uh, uh, study program, I think that may be the, the good starting point. The second thing which we were discussing is that there are no unified approaches among the six institutions. So each of us is uh, different. So we may probably build on the strength of what uh, Timishoara can offer with the, the experience in digitalization and technical things and build on the strength which uh, the Latvian colleague or the Hungarian colleagues built. And probably through the micro credentials, we can build up the common structure, which might be shared across Europe. I think the, the amazing thing about European University is enhancing the capacity and the expertise. What we need to do as the further steps is still to learn. Uh, I'm going through the discussion with all the individual partners now, and I'm amazed that uh, some of them without meeting physically for two years, not knowing each other, have developed some trust into the other partners and the commitment. This is, I think, far the, the most amazing uh, achievement of the, of the project. But I think we need to inst institutionalize that. And uh, we haven't, uh, for example, looked at the quality assurance provisions at the institutions. We don't know how this is done. So I think we need to, first start learning about how things are done at each uh, institution how can we trust what's coming from one institution and is taken by the other one and recognize that and i think with this atmosphere of joint structure of building the common multi-campus uh, university or the, the conglomerate of universities i think we are on a good uh, position because there is a stronger commitment it's easier than if we would sort of pick up randomly one of the partners and start uh, integrating that together. That's for me the advantage of the of the European University. And uh, the last point is, uh, I think it's very much in line with what uh, Don said. I think we need to start uh, even more discuss with the employers and the students what would be their needs in that aspect. Sort of take in on board their expectation and needs because that's why we do that. Indeed, I fully agree with you, and I'm bringing also Katal in here, but uh, just to briefly say something about UDRES and also ICE project, where, as you said, we're building up on trust and developing eye living labs, which were presented also during the Open Education Week workshop, but uh, also creating that structure, which will allow us to somehow jointly, um, or if not jointly, at least in some aspects commonly 
uh, develop the future university and our future for the 2030. And as you mentioned also, one of the most important uh, aspects of micro-credentials is exactly the quality assurance. And for this, I'm very happy to have next to me uh, Katalin Sondi, who is uh, coming from uh, Fachhochschule St. Polten in Austria, who is the leader of the uh, project UDRES and also the EINS project, those two projects which uh, we were mentioning today. And, uh, but she's also coming, uh, is, she's in charge there of the Higher Education uh, Development Service Unit, but she has extensive experience in the European higher education area and into the implementation of the Bologna progress uh, uh, process, sorry. And she has a strong interest on the social political issues. And just as a small remark, because uh, we are doing a live translation on this webinar, she has a PhD in translation and interpretation. So we must uh, ask her if we are doing it right or not. So, uh, Kathleen, please, uh, the floor is yours. Mulțumesc, Diana. This is only <laughs> my <laughs> poor Romanian. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Good evening. I try to share, first of all, my screen. So, which did work out well. So, and then I will try to speak slowly, as slowly as I can. Uh, for the interpreters, <laughs> as I am one myself. So ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, dear audience, um, first of all, I would like to say thank you for the kind invitation, uh, because I'm very happy to participate in this webinar on such an important topic and such a future-oriented topic, let's say. I have participated in several projects on the European uh, level, and on working groups on micro-credentials. So I'm very happy to share my insights and thoughts with you today. And since my working field um, in higher education is not interpreting, but quality assurance, uh, I will focus today on the quality assurance of micro-credentials and the recommendations from the European higher education area. And uh, first of all, I would like to point out the importance of micro-credentials once more, uh, because um, we should think about that people need access to quality teaching and learning provided in different ways today and different ways, different settings to develop their personal, social, cultural, and professional competences. Education systems, and training systems uh, must be more flexible nowadays. And we have to find solutions to deliver more learner-centered and more accessible, more inclusive learning to a wider range of profiles. I think this is clear. And this is also a target from the Bologna process, of course. Uh, the speakers today already pointed out that also non-formal providers of education and training are also addressing this uh, need by providing new and innovative opportunities for upskilling especially and reskilling. Uh, an effective culture of lifelong learning is I think the key to ensure that everyone has the skills they need to thrive in society, the labor market especially, and also in their personal lives. Um, it is also essential that people can access quality and relevant uh, education and training, I think, uh, especially upskilling and reskilling and throughout their lives. So lifelong learning plays a huge role in that process. Uh, the importance of uh, quality assurance, when we are talking about quality assurance of micro-credentials, uh, we have to take a look at uh, two dimensions, I would say. The one dimension is the quality of the credential itself. And the other is more the issuing institution and the processes there uh, at the institutions. Because uh, quality assurance itself protects the integrity of the micro-credential ecosystem as a whole by giving uh, employers and recognizing bodies confidence in the micro-credential being delivered by an issuing authority and by protect protecting also the learners. Uh, 
the most important aspects of micro credentials are, to my opinions, um, opinion the three I have uh, listed on this slide. You see it, and uh, also Mihal was talking about recognition. So um, there is a huge need for transparency. This is also a quality aspect of information to have a fair assessment of micro-credentials. Micro-credentials must be portable. So the credential holder, the learner, uh, must be able to store and share the credential uh, how the, the learner or the credential holder would like. And also stackability was a topic today. Credentials must be uh, uh, combined uh, or uh, able to be combined. So this is also one of the quality aspects, uh, let's say. What are the main pillars of quality assurance? Um, of course, we have to take in account uh, the internal and also the external quality assurance. And uh, Mihai uh, was uh, mentioning the European standards and guidelines for quality assurance. Uh, this is maybe the most important regulation uh, for quality assurance in the European higher education area, which must be applied to all higher education uh, programs offered in uh, Europe or in the European higher education area, any format, duration, or mode of delivery. And uh, this is also um, to apply on micro-credentials, of course. When it comes to the question of, uh, to the role of external quality assurance, and the role of external agencies. It is clear that their role is to support the higher education institutions in developing the policies, the processes for quality assurance and uh, to address internal quality assurance of micro-credentials. The recommendations from European projects, just a few of those, uh, are absolutely in line with uh, the ESG, I would say, like all micro-credentials should be subject to the internal quality assurance with well-built systems to monitor their quality internally. So it is something autonomous. Uh, higher education uh, institute, institutions should publish clear policy and information on how they approach the quality of micro-credentials, of course. And uh, we heard about that uh, from our speakers uh, today. Uh, we also have to include learners in all steps of uh, designing development of uh, micro-credentials, implementation, and also in the quality assurance process of uh, micro-credentials. Uh, there are different types of micro-credentials and they might require different evaluation approaches, of course because uh, we can have standalone micro-credentials and also we can have micro-credentials uh, which are part of a bigger degree program. And also the mode is, can differ like online mode, face-to-face -face mode. Uh, yeah, that's uh, also uh, a factor for quality assurance, of course. And I do have one don'ts because uh, this is very, important, I think, to point out that the uh, application of program level evaluation procedures should not be encouraged for uh, each micro-credential. Um, so external quality assurance uh, does not play such an important role in um, the designing of micro-credentials, let's say. We have also recommendations on standards and elements of the micro-credentials. So this is the part uh, I, was, I have mentioned it before, uh, that the quality of the credential itself is crucial. So there are standard elements um, of the credential itself. Um, I think Don was talking about uh, the learning outcomes uh, and the design of, of the micro-credential itself. Uh, I would say it is quite similar as the diploma supplement, uh, which is not bad, I think, because uh, it's very useful. And 
every each and every higher education institution in the European higher education area should use such a template, such a standardized template, of course, in the process of designing a micro-credential to have a, a fair quality assurance also. And um, let's see, my presentation now will come to an end because uh, we would like to have time for conversations, I think. And I did not have so many slides prepared uh, because of the time schedule. Um, but finally, I would like to point out the next steps because they are very important. Uh, there is the uh, Council uh, uh, recommendation on the European approach to micro-credentials for lifelong learning and employability. And by 2025, the broader use and transferability and recognition of the new standards should be realized. So we are all looking forward to that. And this is the end of my short presentation. If you have any questions right now, do not hesitate. But also if you have uh, further questions, just contact me, please. Thank you very much for this. Um, I'll, um, before we are moving towards, uh, how to say, a further discussion, I have one single question because you mentioned how important is also the structure on the micro credentials and on badges, which we all follow or something like that. Uh, are you aware, because it's just curious, so probably you, I don't, I'm not very sure if you, are you aware of uh, any, let's say, agency or something like that who is validating if, or saying like, at least these are the minimum or is validating if all the certificates which we issue, all of us around Europe at least, are somehow, um, let's say, correct and respecting that. For example, I will just give you an example. We are using Badger as, mm -hmm. uh, let's say, the standard uh, external hub, which is, you know, the extra wallet on where mm -hmm. uh, we keep digitally the micro certificates, and they have a lot of fields to complete. And for example, Badger will not allow you to go further if at least 50% of those fields have been completed and you have inputted uh, valid information there. So uh, that's also sort of validation of what, what you are putting there. Difficult question and, and uh, hard to answer because uh, I think all these standards differ from country to country. And one of the common understandings should be, I think, the Europass, which would be very helpful to find a common uh, uh, understanding for how these standardized uh, designs should be. But maybe Michal has an answer to that. Yes, uh, we are moving now to all of us. And Michal, if you can uh, say something about this, that will be really good uh, regarding on how we are uh, really validating that. As we are all aware, part of the European Digital uh, Education uh, Action Plan, it is exactly this, to create the European certificate, digital certificate which will be fully integrated in Europass. Michal. I'm still have the honor to sit on the executive board of the European Quality Assurance Register uh, so the, from the formal position. And that's uh, basically the register which uh, takes or lists the agencies which uh, are meeting the European standards and guidelines and uh, who sort of, uh, assess the external the institutions or universities which are meeting the European standards and, and guidelines. And there's ongoing discussion on how would we approach that uh, when the micro-credentials come. There's not a single answer, I have to say. I, I'm not aware of any agency which uh, would uh, do that. There are agencies, as far as I understood, which are already looking to some extent at the, at the micro-credentials or shorter uh, learning provisions. But I think it's also very work consuming. So we have to find the, the reasonable balance between the effect and the time spent on, uh, on that. And therefore I'm a little bit uh, reluctant to say that the institutional review of university would cover the the micro-credentials, because if you come to the institution, which is 36,000 students, you have uh, three days to go through all the panel 
review of the management systems, you can say, fine, your quality management, your quality assurance system works well, but you would not necessarily focus on, uh, on uh, micro-credentials. And the other aspect in that, I was reading the proposal of the, the council recommendation uh, just to uh, refresh the, the mind. It is still very much in the hands of, uh, of member states in EU. So this is just the proposal to the member states. Let's discuss how we will do that. And uh, as uh, Cathy said, I think there are so, there's uh, some period set up like two, three years ahead when we should try to address this issue and find the solution. As I said in the beginning, beginning the business doesn't wait. So the, the private providers are uh, running uh, ahead, but we will need some time to find the solution. Yes, I think uh, I think you're right. Uh, Don, you wanted to say something, please. No, no oh, I, I thought I thought you're you're raising your hand, so I apologize. So uh, what? And, and probably Don, I'm going down to you um, because you've been doing this also in the United States, where the value of the certificate is not as in Europe. You know, with all of these quality assurance agencies and, and everybody else. It's the value of the certificate is given by the issuer, how the, the issuer is, uh, is, how to say, how, what's the brand of the issuer, how the industry validates the issuer, even if it is a, a company or a university or an association. So how is that working there and why is not working in Europe or even in Romania, for example? I know this well, question. Uh, um, well, I've been gone from uh, from America for almost 17 years now, so I'm not as tuned in, but I spent a lot of years there uh, ahead of time. Um, wow, you know, if you ever were going to say apples and oranges, this would be the time to say that. Because in the United States, I, and I'm sure that uh, Sandy and I'm sure Michael know this too. There is no national qualifications framework. Never has been and there never will be. And so then you say, well, why not? And then you say, well, you guys seem to do a pretty good job in higher education, the way you're ranked. So you must be doing something right. The problem is trying to figure out a consensus of where all those people are that are doing it right. And part of the issue is this, is that US and Canadian higher education is state-based. It's not national. All education, you go from California to Nevada to Arizona, completely different, okay? So my answer to your question is in a lot of ways, Many people thought Europe was overly ambitious with Bologna. I think they've done a marvelous job with this. I think it is absolutely remarkable that you can bring that many countries together and generally agree. And if you remember with Bologna, what people often forget is it didn't mean you couldn't have a four-year bachelor's. It didn't mean you couldn't have a two-year, uh, or excuse me, yeah, two-year master's or even a longer doctoral. The guidelines were three, one, and then a core for the doctorate and the diploma supplement. These are all pieces that I think, if, if I understood Michael and uh, Karpazit and Sandy correctly, should help us hopefully here in Europe do a better job of um, how we're gonna tackle this. But I would just add, uh, so I guess my response is, is America's a little different to try to, to do direct <clears throat> comparisons with. I mean, I think um, you have so many agencies, even in each state, who have responsibility for imposing standards and competencies in different areas. You do have national organizations too. Move to the vocational technical areas, like let's just use welding as an example. The American Welding Society sets the standards and competencies for welders. So that's the national program, but it's not a government program. It's an independent certifying agency of, of welders. I think, um, I think Sandy and Michael hit on the two most critical issues. How do you get people to agree? The credit for prior experience in the United States of America is a mitigated disaster. It's never worked. 
And the reason it doesn't work is because universities will accept all your credits. That's not the issue. The issue is how those credits are applied. So as a student, I might transfer to a university and they'll say, oh yeah, we'll accept all those little micro-credentials and those things you did in, in Europe and everything. And then they get down to the academic department and the academic department says, uh-uh, no, 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 you're not gonna get in the door with that. And so what happens is you have a lot of these things that academics just won't recognize. Now, I don't know if that's as big a problem in Europe, but that's been really the Achilles heel of credit for prior experience uh, in the US and Canada is you, you gotta get everybody to agree what constitutes those standards and those levels of competency. And I think those are the, uh, those are the issues that I think Sandy uh, and Kaparzik would tell us very clearly are critical in Europe too. How do we get consensus of the right players to say, yes, that's what constitutes a level one guitar player. I'm a guitar player, okay? But if someone says, I play the guitar, okay. They play three chords. Do they play the guitar? Yes. You have somebody else who's been playing for 45 years, like me, I can play a little bit differently. But the problem is, is that the person sits down next to me is Eric Clapton. And Eric Clapton picks up the guitar and go, and we all go, whoa, he can play the guitar. You see, and we're talking about completely different skill levels. Now we have to get everybody to agree on what that level one, two, and three are. And that, it's the challenge, but it's the challenge that I believe we can meet. I think we're well on our way to doing that in a lot of ways. Um, but I also think Sandy and Kaparzik were very honest in saying we have some challenges to get there. It's not going to be easy to, uh, to achieve this consensus, but I think it's possible. And if we can do it, here's what we haven't said tonight. Here's what we need to say. It will go back and it will benefit the student. This isn't about us. This isn't about accrediting agencies or the European Commission. This is about making it easier for students who are out there to have a portfolio of, of credentials that they can take when they move across Europe with mobility for employment. That was the whole reason behind Bologna was to ensure that mobility would be recognized across borders. So I see micro-credentials in Europe as being very, um, very much aligned with Bologna, as I think was alluded to earlier, and, and the diploma supplement. You know, the diploma supplement, what it does is tells us exactly what a student should be able to do. Um, I don't know what the regular universities offer um, uh, in Canada, but in the US, it's pretty vague. It has the list of the classes the student took, but that's pretty much it. So that's one area um, that I think will be the same in the US as it is in Europe. You're gonna have these third party repositories keeping track of micro-credentials um, with a lot more detail as was shown earlier, the different elements so that an employer as well as a student can go out and anyone who can read it will understand the, the skills that that particular uh, student or employee can do. So let me stop there. Yes, and I think I will pick it up from there because I fully agree with you. One of, there are two aspects, at least from my perspective, for why micro credentials are so important. One is the period, either in volume or in time. It doesn't matter. It's much more shorter and it's much more focused and it allows for modularity for many, many years, to be honest. I, I advocated for modularity and for validation also of informal or prior experiences. And especially if you do, I don't know, a series of open lectures or a series of something that validates something and how you validate that and how you collect that and how you bring that, um, it's quite important. The second aspect, as you mentioned, is the wallet, the digital wallet. Is uh, We use um, open systems, basically, 
we are looking now at blockchain system, which is the most, how to say, certified, guaranteed, and, and validated technically and digitally, that nothing can be changed on those credentials, on those competencies, on that profile, and you will be able to carry it out with you because uh, it's not only one issuer and one, how to say, validation system, it's multiplied. So you will have the same information in so many systems that it's going to be quite impossible to be fa falsified or, or changed or, or not validated. So mm -hmm. that's probably one of the technical solutions. How the learner, and I'm speaking generally as learner, not necessarily as a student, will really look forward to that. Are they really going to use it? In my opinion, yes. Probably I'm a bit, uh, let's say, oriented towards technical uh, specializations or technical mm -hmm. degrees. But in technical degrees, the market, I mean, the industry is really looking very much, and this is coming also from companies and from the massive open online courses. So if you are a really big brand company, which produces a heavy technology or a software, they have this system where they bring, give those certificates. Now they also give them digital certificates, obviously. And that's what the companies are looking for. Also from us, for example, short training programs, which we do at the Polytechnic, Polytechnic University in Timisoara, the several companies here, they will look at that. They will ask, have you graduated that is formal learning or informal learning, which is in the diploma supplement, if it is accredited by the university, mm -hmm. or if it is a joint thing done with another association or a company or a, a, a software producer or something like that, that will also be valuable. So that's the adding extra value which I think the learners will need to understand that it's really their portfolio, their competencies, and they need to, to carry it out with them. It's not as much us as higher education, university alliances, or any, any other association. We just need to give them the opportunity of doing it, but, um, and obviously to encourage them to do it. Uh, so now for the final question, because we only have about four or five minutes left, Mikhail, I'm going to you. From the European universities' alliances and perspective, what do you think is going to be the biggest danger or the, the most challenging or the thing where they will be able to fail, especially in terms of education or on, uh, on these micro-credentials which we are discussing now, not speaking of or any of the other aspects, just looking at this. Well, I don't know yet, uh, but I would refer... The not easy, never easy, you know. Uh, we will find out, but uh, I believe that one of the risks is the one which uh, both Katalin and uh, Don have mentioned, this uh, sort of ownership of this is my program. This is the only way how we can sort of deliver the, the knowledge and skills and not accepting that there are more different ways or flexible ways how to reach to the same point through different pathways. So I think we need really open minds and uh, more understanding why do we do things uh, the way we do, respect to other uh, pathways or other approaches and learn from each other. I think that would be one of the most uh, tricky parts, basically recognizing that uh, my way of uh, teaching history is not always uh, shared with uh, all the mm. colleagues. Mm. Yeah, and in that context, we also have a question, which I overlooked, I apologize that, from Virgil Rotaro, a good friend who is in charge here in the medical university, in the medical sciences university with innovation and so on. Uh, he's asking, isn't there an opportunity for university to use micro-credentials as educational instruments, introducing the university co-curricula, which is, as I said, our external courses which are optional or something like that in Romania at least within their internationalization strategy. So if they want really to be able to offer them in different languages or to foreign students and not necessarily to in Romanian or in German or something like that. Who wants to answer to this? Maybe I could answer that. Yes, because I totally yes, agree that this could be also an opportunity 
And it is an opportunity right now, I think, because uh, we could have that way, as you said now, Diana, like to have uh, micro credentials for language learning, but also for the staff at universities. This is also a kind of upskilling for uh, uh, didactic approaches, for uh, upskilling for administrative staff, but also for teachers, of course, professors, because uh, lifelong learning is also uh, for, for those uh, at, uh, at the universities, of course. And we also should participate, participate on, on micro-credentials, internal micro-credentials, maybe let's say. I don't know if the others agree with me. Let's see who wants, yes, Don, please. Um, I, I certainly agree with you. Um, I would distinguish between internationalism going out and internationalism coming in. We know from, we know from the data uh, the number of online programs abroad going international. We have the capability, we know that, we, what the internet can do. But the amount of programs going out of the country and continent, very, very, very small. Uh, our programs online tend to stay within our national borders or at least within the continent that we're serving. Now flip it over, international students coming to our campuses. I think it's an incredible opportunity for international students, as you said, just from your own area in linguistics. Imagine a student coming from China or India, arrives in Austria and can get a degree in teaching in German or English for you know three or four classes to do that. I think, I think there are elements of internationalism that uh, it could be very, very, very attractive. Um, I think the other issue for me, when universities start talking about taking their programs outside the country and going international, you got to defend that back home. You got to explain to your key stakeholders, why are you delivering programs to China or India or somewhere else when we have our own needs right here that need to be addressed? So it sometimes can be a little... Uh, a little uh, challenging when you want to go out, but but certainly I I agree with Sandy. Um, there are many many opportunities. Absolutely. Indeed, I think there are. Yes, Michal. Yes, you want to add something, and uh, as we are going to close quite soon. If... Oh, oh, well, no, I was just going ahead, but uh, fine. Absolutely agree. Well, one thing which I would uh, then like to add, I see the micro credentials as a fantastic opportunity of keeping in touch with alumni, updating their skills uh, sort of, uh, and do something what I think we still don't uh, manage that well as the American and Canadian uh, universities, keeping the touch with people who graduated and uh, having the, the community. Uh, mm. Not sure if uh, that works everywhere, but uh, my feeling was that uh, in North America, this sort of a wider community is much stronger and that helps the feedback, but also the support of development of the university. I need to fully agree with you. The only ones which in Europe do that as well are the, the British universities and none of the others, neither French, German, Romanian, and so on. We like, we, we like to use them, to know them, but uh, just very, I mean, in short snippets from somewhere and that's something which we will need to look further. At always at these webinars, uh, at the closing, uh, we usually present a tool. Today, I, I choose not to present a tool, just not to make it longer because I knew we are going to speak uh, uh, a lot. So apologize for our listeners for that. But uh, um, we close with one single word. So each of you will need to say only one word which will represent your hope for how micro-credentials can be used in universities in Europe. Who wants to start? One word. One adjective, adverb, I don't care. Just need to be one word. Don? Impreuna. Impreuna, that's good. That's together in English. <laughs> Michal? Flexibility. But I was thinking that if I use the German word, I can basically build entire sentence into one word, but flexibility. Kathleen. 
I would say culture. Okay, so that together, flexible, we built a new culture in higher education. And that will be probably our closing remark today. We've been speaking in English with a good translation from the e-learning unit in Timisoara. Uh, American Canadian living in Romania, a Romanian living in Romania, a Czech working internationally, and a Hungarian living <laughs> living in, in, in Austria. So we really proved that we can go as multinational as possible and have, let's say, common interests and common common goals. Thank you very much. I will join. I will speak now in, in Romanian, if you will allow me. Vă mulțumesc foarte mult pentru prezență și pentru faptul că ați venit astăzi la acest webinar dedicat microcredențialelor. Săptămâna viitoare vom merge și vom vorbi despre IEEE, despre Asociația IEEE, fiindcă ne apropiem de Săptămâna Educației Internaționale IEEE. Vom vedea care sunt uneltele și modalitățile prin care educația tehnică poate fi îmbunătățită și nu vom vorbi doar de universități, ci mai ales de ce pot să facă universitățile pentru învățământul secundar, liceal, pentru a îmbunătăți capacitățile în știință, tehnică, inginerie, matematică, dar și în artă și cultură cu ajutorul tehnologiei. Vă mulțumesc mult de tot! Sunt Diana Andone, la revedere și o seară frumoasă!